How much of science today reflects unfounded dogma versus the true reality of nature and consciousness? How many principles are taught in absolutist terms, denying the full and meaningful exploration of those concepts? As human beings have a pathological need for acceptance by the herd, we are very much creatures of habit. The fear of standing out rules both those applying for and those doling out research grants. This appears to be the rule ignored by only a small number of courageous researchers. This podcast is inspired by a recent YouTube video from biologist and author Rupert Sheldrake. One very interesting factoid in the show notes for that video is that a recent TED talk by this same presenter was then banned or taken out of circulation by TED. As an aside, I have been avoiding TED Talks for years now as their censorship practices become apparent to me. In the hour-long YouTube talk predicated on this recent book, Science Set Free, he concentrates on the 10 dogmatic principles listed here. I will mention several of his ideas along with my own commentary. Number one, nature is mechanical or machine-like. Stars, animals, plants, etc. are all machines. The governing concept going back to Isaac Newton and other fathers of the Enlightenment is that the universe and everything in it comprise a grand mechanism. We are all cogs in a great clock set in motion by God. Contrary to what many believe, Copernicus, Newton, Darwin, and Einstein were not a-religious. The equations, laws, or principles of physics and chemistry were thought of as being conceived by God. We only sought to discover their secrets. Exactly how this is reconciled with free will has always been in question. Number two, the total amount of matter and energy is conserved. The founders of chemistry and physics put forth that certain quantities are conserved, i.e. energy, momentum, and matter. Einstein postulated an equivalence between energy and matter in his famous equation E equals mc squared. They were taught that all of the matter we see in the universe has always been there, or has been since the Big Bang. (laughs) With the improvement of observational tools, we now have dark energy and dark dark matter, which we're told makes up the vast majority of the cosmos. Now we don't have any direct evidence that either of these exist. The search has been going on for decades. Rather, it is convenient that the amount of dark matter or dark energy is just enough to explain the anomalies in what we can actually see. Number three, the laws of nature are fixed. There exist physical constants in nature, such as big G, the gravitational constant, or H, Planck's constant. In his talk, nothing could illustrate the absurdity of such absolutism than his own investigation. In the Great British Library, Sheldrake dragged out books with lists of the various standards for comparison. New records for these constants are available about every 10 years or so. In one example, the speed of light had dropped by some 20 kilometers per second between 1928 and 1940, only to rise again. Similarly, the gravitational constant, g, also varied from one measurement to another and over time. In consulting with a keeper of standards in the UK, he was told this was due to error or the averaging of several measurements. It was pointed out that discrepancies were out of line with experimental error, though it was noted that variations were well outside the indicated error bars. Fear not, we can all be safe knowing that a law was passed in Great Britain fixing the speed of light, so it shall never change. Upon leaving this keeper of records, Sheldrake was offered a pamphlet entitled The Latest Values of the Physical Constants. Number four, matter is unconscious. For many societies throughout the ages, the idea that lakes, rocks, plants, and animals were imbued with spirits has been the norm. A small number still believe this today. 
As yet, I've not come across a concrete definition of consciousness. Does it apply knowledge of oneself and one's surroundings? What exactly is knowledge versus instinct? Microbes move and respond to changes in their environment. In search of food or in response to stimulus, are they conscious? Where does my consciousness end and another begin? We believe that consciousness is attached or associated with matter. Then quantum mechanics tells us that there are no true boundaries between one atom and another, regardless of how far apart they are. My molecules overlap yours and yours overlap those of trees and rocks. Does that mean there is individual consciousness or only a collective one? Number five, nature is purposeless as in a machine. Other than for humans, angels, or God, the Cartesian view separated man and the rest of nature. Anyone who cares for a dog, cat, goat, or any other animal knows this cannot be the case. For some time, however, this notion mirrored religion in that man should have dominance over nature and all creatures. Perhaps this was a way to explain away all of the cruelty inflicted on animals and the wasteful treatment of the environment. Of course, it does not explain the cruelty and we inflict on each other. Even if we do not know what that purpose is, we all feel there is some reason for being. Number six, biological inheritance is material via DNA. I'm inclined to believe that inheritance is primarily via DNA, but there seem to be other paths. Many animals, such as humans, bears, chimpanzees, and the like, actively teach their offspring survival skills. At least in the case of humans, our offspring are essentially a blank slate. If so-called civilization collapsed tomorrow, what survival skills would the average person have, and what skills would any of their children have? They need to be taught, since those skills are not in our DNA. We need to see examples or solve simple cases before we can move up the learning curve. One could say that the survival skill imprinted in our DNA is the desire to teach our offspring, but not much more. Sheldrake brings up an entirely new path of adaptation called morphic resonance. Adaptation to certain toxins by cells not exposed to those toxins has been observed. Briefly, cell cultures were exposed to toxins along with their offspring over several generations. As we might expect, the cells which survived to divide, but ending up in the next culture survived at a higher rate, indicating that some had developed immunity. At the same time, cultures of the same generation were grown, yet not exposed, at least not initially. Later on, the strains which had never been exposed had developed immunity. The question is, how is this possible if they were not descended from a strain of survivors? Supposedly, this synchronicity extends to other areas, according to Sheldrake. In the case of learning, for example, teaching crows or rats a particular trick in Los Angeles is mysteriously connected to rats or crows in New York or Tokyo learning the same tricks. Morphic resonance is the idea that there is a connection between these creatures and that skills or immunities are mysteriously transferred from one to the next. Is there such a thing as collective consciousness? Whether there is or is not, the study of such things must not be shunned. Number seven, memories are stored as material traces inside of the brain. In other podcasts, we've discussed the nature of intelligence, of which memory is a key component. Without some form of memory, learning cannot take place. Slime molds do not have brains, yet they can learn. Animals with very small brains, and consequently a lower capacity for memory, by this notion, can be very intelligent. Crows, octopuses, rats, and other creatures are capable of learning and maintaining memories over the long term. Crows recognize individual humans as friends or enemies after years of absence. Then there is the idea of morphic resonance described above. Number eight, the mind is inside the head, inseparable from the brain. 
Where the mind resides has not been definitively proven. A strong association with the brain exists, no doubt. However, there are many instances indicating an extended range. We cannot even define what the mind is, let alone where it resides. As above, how might we explain cognitive abilities in the absence of nerve cells? Dr. Michael Levine has shown how small groups of cells in frogs or flatworms seem to know how to organize themselves. These cell blobs will rearrange into a frog's face after they are scrambled, a new limb, head, or tail. Cells and groups of cells retain a master plan for new cells, including number, function, and location, when no nerves are present. Communication between cells is exhibited in electrical activity shown by special dyes. So there exists both a plan stored in some fashion of memory and a plan which Levine calls cellular software. Number nine, psychic phenomena are illusory. This includes out-of-body experiences, ESP, or precognition. There are few people who really believe this, yet, yet there's not a lot of funding to promote genuine scientific research. Nearly everyone I know has experienced deja vu, the anticipation of a phone call, which happens moments later, or the feeling someone is watching you across the room, which is then verified. Likely, far more have had a lucid dream or out-of-body experience, but won't admit it. In the few controlled studies which have been done, more extraordinary feats of remote viewing or extrasensory perception have been noted. Such phenomena are worthy candidates of study, even if we don't quite know how to study them yet. Number 10, mechanistic medicine is the only valid form. This conjecture would rule out any ideas of mind over matter, self-healing, or placebo effects. Buddhist monks and other holy men have long shown that pain can be controlled. There is no explanation for the placebo effect. The benefits of prayer or any holistic non-chemical or nutritional treatment. A more plausible explanation for the acceptance of this by society is that the money in herbal or holistic medicine is very low compared to pharmaceuticals. In the early part of the 20th century, it was Rockefeller who commissioned a nationwide study of medical schools to discover which ones were more favorable to writing prescriptions. At the same time, the half or more practitioners who used effective traditional remedies were demonized as quacks. Then the Rockefeller and Carnegie Foundations gave generously to those medical schools who advocated the prescribing of pills. Doctors these days are taught very little about pharmaceuticals, nutrition, or other treatments. This podcast has only touched the surface of the many areas which mainstream science prefers to ignore. Episodes in the future will explore such topics in an attempt to break out of this cage of conformity.